Hello and welcome to Airheads, a not so serious look at the serious business of royal rumours, gossip and gowns. I'm Tom. And I'm Maeve. And this week we saw Prince Charles make his Fashion Week debut. Or as Nettles did, anyway. <laughs> this was at the London Fashion Week show from the designers Finn and Omi, who are like this eco label they're very dedicated to creating new textiles and processes that are sustainable they do a lot of work with debbie harry they've also made clothes for grace and perry and pamela anderson and now with prince charles so he met them at a reception last year and after hearing about them and their interest in sustainability he offered them the nettles from his garden at Highgrove. And rather than this just drifting away, they actually followed up on it and there were two harvests of nettles. (laughs) So I got to see the end product of this. I went to the show on Tuesday. It was in the Savoy Hotel, very swish. It was in this very opulent function room, ballroom type place there. The floor was covered in these black and white bunches of paper. There was a big display all in the shape of nettles. The whole room goes totally dark. All the lights come down and then you hear the voice of Debbie Harry like booming over the speakers. She gives this little speech where she says things like, screw each other but stop fucking the planet (laughs) which is the name of this campaign she does with them and then the lights come up and they start playing like the weirdest selection of music tom the first one was this kind of very stripped back indie version of california dreaming and then it went into that kanye west jay-z song no church in the wild and there was also cranberries zombie (laughs) very emotional for me personally charles wasn't there his head gardener Deb's good enough was there and I wish Charles had been there though because the juxtaposition of having Charles on the front row and this procession of looks like the first few were I think they were latex it was basically the skin tight outfits showing a lot of flesh you had a lot of men with their shirts off lots of really short skirts (laughs) and these huge head pieces very punky makeup like (laughs) just worlds away from high growth it was 66 looks looks in total which is a lot and the last segment of that was all the nettle clothes and they were really impressive i thought they looked absolutely beautiful like the way the fabric moved it was very light and fluffy yeah they had some really good models they had some famous people joe wood ronnie woods ex-wife was there and a bunch of olympians that i didn't know but it was really cool seeing like joe wood had this dress made out of the nettles that was like this fluffy little mini dress and what she had these big gold boots on she was kind of stomping down the catwalk and the dress was like moving along with her which i thought was pretty cool and then they had little boob tubes made out of the nettle (laughs) fabric and a big coat we did an instagram story highlight from the show which you can see at airheads pod do you want to talk about how they made the clothes oh yeah they took the nettles and they stripped off the leaves and then they rot them down in a process called retting which leaves you just with the fibers which they then kind of like processed in a kind of new way they were like there was part of it was like weaving and stuff but they also developed a mercerization process for the fabric which has no impact on the environment and it kind of lightens the fibers from the kind of greeny brown you'd expect from nettles to this light cream um, which meant that they could dye some bits of it so there were like some like blues and pinks and things but then the actual just undyed was probably my favorite they did an interview vin and omi they just go by their first names they did an interview with the telegraph where they talked about working with Charles and they said that after the first harvest they had a letter from Prince Charles saying he's full of admiration for our work and they said they were pretty surprised at his support I really like this quote we're a punk brand most of our clients are punk you know Marilyn Manson and people like that we thought the juxtaposition between Prince Charles and us was so far apart that it wouldn't work but he's really happy with it he's really happy with the aesthetics and how it's going I love that quote about the aesthetics I just love the idea of him seeing these clothes and loving it and not trying to step in or intervene or put his own stamp on it at all. Yeah, I mean, if they'd had to kind of come out with a selection of double-breasted suits, you'd know (laughs) that something had been said. 
I loved also learning that this isn't the only fashionable partnership that Prince Charles has. He also works quite closely with the jewellery brand Pippa Small that you might know because Meghan wears their jewellery a lot and Kate Middleton wears their jewellery a lot. Um, But Charles has worked with them on Turquoise Mountain, which seeks to invest in historic areas and traditional crafts to provide job skills and a renewed sense of pride. Do you think the pieces that Meghan and Kate wear were presents from Charles? His Christmas presents. Yes. I mean, very good eye, if so. Oh, yeah. Well, I think he does have a good eye. (laughs) I think, though, it's quite interesting that Charles has been criticized so much for being too outspoken about things like the environment or education or anything that's seen as too political or trying to intervene with politics like writing letters to ministers and stuff like that i remember reading biography of charles that said he was often be instructed to be more like his mom and that she was this kind of epitome of political neutrality but it looks like that's not really the case Yeah, so David Cameron is about to release his memoir, and he's been doing a lot of uh, kind of press around it. Yet another Prime Minister blabbing about their private conversations with the Queen, basically. This was the big takeaway for us. He suggested to the Queen's private secretary how the monarch could influence the outcome of the 2014 Scottish independence referendum. It was at a time when the side that wanted independence were leading in the polls. In interviews this week, David Cameron explicitly admits that he sought intervention from the Queen. I remember conversations I had with my private secretary and he had with the Queen's private secretary and I had with the Queen's private secretary, not asking for anything that would be in any way improper or unconstitutional, but just a raising of the eyebrow, even, you know, a quarter of an inch, would be thought, you know, make a difference. If it makes a difference, then it's unconstitutional. (laughs) And... She did. She did it. Yeah, because she said to somebody after one of her church services in Balmoral, it was reported that she said to this woman, I hope people will think very carefully about the future, which is a hell of a lot more than an eyebrow raise, right? Yeah, and it clearly had a big impact because the no side won out in the end. The Queen's comments were believed to have influenced a lot of people who hadn't made up their minds yet. And she was apparently thrilled with the result David Cameron was overheard telling someone that she had purred down the line to him when they spoke on the phone after the results came in 2014, a comment for which he had to apologize, saying that he made a terrible mistake. Yeah. Disgusting language. (laughs) (laughs) I can't imagine how angry the Queen must have been when she heard that. I mean, probably not as angry as she was this week this incredible quote from a source at the palace. They told the BBC that there was an amount of displeasure at David Cameron's comments. Jeez, an amount. I That amount must <laughs> Cannot fill- be quantified. <laughs> <laughs> I really liked the way a royal correspondent put it. This is uh, Johnny Diamond, who was talking to the BBC. He basically described the relationship between the Queen and the Prime Minister as like Fight Club. First rule of Fight Club is... You do not talk about Fight Club. Second rule of Fight Club is, you do not talk about Fight Club. The first rule of the relationship between the Prime Minister and the Queen is that you never, ever talk about the relationship between the Prime Minister and the Queen. (laughs) I also enjoyed his translation of this statement from the palace. He said, you can probably read that as cold fury. (laughs) (laughs) Not just because he has broken the first rule, but because he has made it painfully clear that in 2014 he used the Queen for his own political purposes and that she and her advisors thought that was okay. So basically, like, she wasn't angry that he had asked her to intervene. She was angry that he revealed that she had been more than happy to intervene. And, you know, the big thing about the Queen is that she's meant to be above politics and the fact that she is seen as above politics makes an intervention like this all the more powerful. This comes at such a tricky time for the Queen because we've had all this Brexit stuff, all the conversation about the Queen and proroguing Parliament and the potential like railroading of MPs debating Brexit, her relationship with Boris Johnson and who she has been or hasn't been uh, having meetings with. You can't really keep taking this line about the Queen's political neutrality seriously. 
it does look particularly bad after the Scottish court deemed the prorogation was illegal and that the advice that Boris Johnson gave to the Queen was bad advice. Yeah. And the Queen took that bad advice. I think it looks terrible for the Queen, as this BBC analysis says. Both of these cases highlight the dark greys of the Queen's constitutional position, the discretion she has or lacks under extraordinary circumstances to speak out and act. I mean, like, we all knew the Queen didn't want Scotland to be independent anyway. Of course she wants the United Kingdom to stay united. I wouldn't be surprised if she supports Brexit either. So it's not like it's not in line with her own political views, but we're just not meant to know about them. (laughs) I imagine Dave Cameron will be doing a lot of (laughs) apologising after this then. In other apologies (laughs) this week, the BBC has apologised to Prince Harry for failing to warn him before broadcasting and publishing an image from a neo-Nazi group on social media. It's a really horrible image, we're not going to discuss it. But what's interesting about it is that Harry raised his concern directly with Ofcom, who's like a watchdog for um, broadcasting standards. Yeah, we heard a really good statement from Prince Harry's spokesperson who said the image had, quote, raised serious security concerns and caused his family great distress, specifically while his wife was nearly five months pregnant, which is definitely the first acknowledgement from the palace that Meghan is not immune to this often racist bullying and the comments on social media and in the traditional media. We should note that the apology isn't for broadcasting the image, it's for not warning him or her before they did it. And Harry's said that he's grateful for the apology, but part of his concern was that hateful and dangerous propaganda had been spread globally by the world's most important public service broadcaster. Due to the credibility of the BBC, their choice to publicise this material created an open door for all other media to reproduce it. So it still stands that, you know, Harry's point is you can describe these kind of images and say this is what's happening without showing the images. Harry and Meghan did get a little bit of a break this week, though. We saw them in Rome. the spectacle to end all spectacles in the dress to end all dresses (laughs) this was at misha nunu's wedding to an oil tycoon named michael or mikey hess we don't say oil tycoon anymore though we say energy entrepreneur (laughs) he's had a bit of an image rebrand but I guess the important thing that all of the papers were quick to report on was that Harry and Meghan had flown commercial. Thank God for that. (laughs) Yeah, I thought it was a little bit smug of all the reporters really patting themselves on the back like we've successfully bullied them into (laughs) flying commercial. But don't worry, after the hell of flying commercial, they arrived in Rome and went to a 17th century villa. We didn't see them at the rehearsal dinner on the Thursday night, but on Friday they swept in to the sunset wedding ceremony to the sound of audible gasps. And that was just us in London. (laughs) (laughs) I love this detail. I also am crazy about the guest list. There was Beatrice and her man Edo. There was Eugenie. And then we had the music royalty, Katy Perry. And Paul McCartney. (laughs) Um, Orlando Bloom was there, of course, with Katie. Cardi Kloss and her husband, Josh Kushner. And then Mikey's buddies, Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump. I want to know how long it took Ivanka to make a move to go and talk to Meghan. I can just see her and Jared standing in the corner, gazing over at Meghan and Harry, plotting their move. Ivanka has, like, Terminator vision. She was (laughs) scanning the room. (laughs) With her new political bob. (laughs) Did she curtsy? (laughs) I like to think that she had been practicing curtsying for ages and then she went and did it and totally fucked it up. (laughs) (laughs) I think she would have sauntered over and acted like they were old pals. Harry, so good to see you again. (laughs) Megan, delighted to meet you. Oh, actually, they met before, didn't they? Because she was on the TIG. Oh, so they'd be reminiscing over TIG days. 
also intrigued as to whether Meghan and Harry were talking to Katy Perry and Orlando Bloom. <laughs> were they cozying up to Carly Gloss? <laughs> you know, I do think that with this kind of guest list, you would have a lot of people who want to take a lot of pictures and that having Harry and Meghan there might have made that difficult. Yeah. But we didn't see any pictures of misha in her dress which she made herself but i'm sure we've got an upcoming exclusive in vogue or people or harper's bazaar one of those but we do know from the mail on sunday reporting that this was the greatest spectacle rome has seen since the return of caesar just a stunning quote <laughs> oh my god it did look incredibly beautiful Oh, yeah. Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous ceremony. We learned in this piece in the mail that Harry and Meghan were smuggled out of a side entrance at 12.45 a.m. with security guards blocking photographers into a people carrier with blacked out windows, which is like pretty standard, I think. Yeah. And that they had to miss out on the rest of the reception, which was themed La Dolce Vita with a dress code that just read dazzling. Incredible. I did like, though, that even though they had to miss the party, Megan still snuck in a little tribute to Misha Nunu on Sussex World's Instagram. They shared a post on Saturday to mark the success of the Smart Set collection, a little carousel of three photos, and the second photo was of Megan and Misha hugging. Very sweet picture. And also, the good news that in just over a week, the support for the collection has helped equip the women of Smartworks with enough units to help for a full year. Um, but also on Instagram, we got a new picture from Archie's christening. Yeah, we missed this. We had recorded just before it came out and we were delighted to see this little collage. Every picture hand-selected by Megan, I would imagine. Oh, definitely. Absolute boss move with the new christening pic adorable yeah. picture but tom my favorite was top left in the corner i didn't even think about it there was a picture of diana and harry harry's a little baby and it wasn't until we went back and looked at it again we realized this was a picture of harry being carried off a private plane when he's pretty much around the same age as archie of all the pictures of Harry and Diana. Megan chose that one. She's so smart. She's just <laughs> so good at doing these little digs. I love it. Also had a, a nice little caption where Megan said, you are the best husband and most amazing dad to our son. We love you with a heart emoji. Happiest birthday. That's nice. I mean, very warm. Unlike <laughs> Will's message. Kensington Royal shared a picture of Prince William and Harry from before this alleged feud began <laughs> and had a little birthday message. And in the mirror, we heard that fans had criticised the message as being cold and generic and not heartfelt enough. While in the sun, we heard that fans had praised Will for his classy and loving message. Like, <laughs> two takes on a one-sentence message. Yeah. <laughs> So, classy or cold, you decide. Speaking of the Cambridges, Kate was out this week. We had a little embargoed visit to a children's centre in Camberwell. So she was there to celebrate this initiative, the Family Nurse Partnership, which matches young mothers with specially trained family nurses. And it's something that is run in Evelina, London, which is a children's hospital that she's patron of. And so she was visiting this place in Camberwell uh, to see how they were doing. She was speaking to a lot of the members of staff, the parents that were there. One of the kids, a four-year-old called Oliver, gave Kate some flowers when she arrived. And Oliver's mother spoke about the conversation she had with Kate, during which Kate revealed that children grow up so quickly and she can't believe George is six already. A comment that made the front pages for some reason. <laughs> the most boring piece of small talk ever like one up from god it's rainy today you know <laughs> yeah i think she does better when she's talking to kids rather than their parents i think what i want to talk about tom is the culottes kate's trying to make culottes happen she keeps trying and <laughs> i don't know if it's working for me 
these were a pair of Zara culottes, only 30 pounds. And they were black, very wide leg with a polka dot shirt from equipment and some block heels. I am just not sure about this look on her. The culottes and shirt seems to be her new sort of silhouette for the cooler months. Yeah. It is an interesting departure from all the coat dresses, but I just don't know if I get on board with it. The culottes wearing you as opposed to your wearing the culottes, if you know what I mean. We were incorrectly informed last week. We apologise. <laughs> Profusely. <laughs> in the bottom of our for hearts. doubting the Blue Peter Royal Garden competition because we finally have an answer to the mystery that we were so... Desperate to solve last week. <laughs> finally, we know who the winner is. And it is Jessica. Well done, Jessica. Jessica from Lincolnshire, well done. So well done, you. She's done a beautiful design of a butterfly with kind of metal wings and they're going to grow flowers over it. So that'll be nice. We saw this on an episode of Blue Peter this week. Kate returned to Blue Peter, triumphant comeback. (laughs) Really enjoyed this episode. (laughs) Yeah, we got a really good insight into Kate the judge and what her process is, what she's looking for. She was wearing that gorgeous LK Bennett, the pink floral dress. She was judging with some guy from the RHS ben. and the CBBC's gardening guru. It's George. George. Welly boots. I do think that George came across as a little more charismatic than Kate in some of these clips. Honestly, the clips of the judging were woeful. Yeah. Kate saying... The messaging behind this is also really impactful. This person's thought about all the different seasons. Yeah. Just totally empty comments you know yeah. impactful is a word that i was reading in the telegraph is apparently the number one word that everyone in the palace wants to be used about the young royals so clearly this pr speak has drilled itself into kate's brain and she's applying it to these five to fifteen year olds <laughs> at the Peter. but it just wasn't the best showcase for her abilities i think The conversations between her and the winners were very stilted and she came across really underprepared. Yeah, so there were two runners-up who were younger in younger categories. Really small little girls. She just said to them... And I can remember seeing your beautiful designs. So well done, you. So she just says that she enjoyed seeing their designs. She doesn't say one thing about what their designs were. She's only meeting two people. She could have been given two things to say before the camera started rolling. Like, there needed to be someone on her team saying, this is the girl who designed this one. Say something about this type of flower. Say something about this part of her illustration. Just something to make it specific to these girls. I mean, I'm sure they were still delighted. They looked thrilled with the whole thing, but just seemed very lackluster. If this is going to be Kate's brand, she needs to step it up a bit. We also got an update on Prince George. This week, the most popular little prince at school. He, we are told, often has playdates with his many, many friends. Because he's so popular. He's very popular at school. (laughs) I know about popular. But it does involve a bit more planning than a normal playdate, says the son, as everyone visiting the palace has to be security vetted. Like, duh. Obviously. (laughs) This does, of course, raise the point that everyone visiting any of the palaces has to be vetted, which would include one Jeffrey Epstein and (laughs) Gillette Maxwell. If they're going to be vetting, like, (laughs) six-year-olds, you're going to bet that they know everything about Jeffrey. So what's going on with Prince Andrew this week? So this week, the relationship between Fergie and Epstein has kind of come up again. This is the loan of £15,000 that she accepted from him uh, in 2011. She then subsequently issued an apology in which she said, amongst other things, that she abhors paedophilia. Unlike the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, anything where you have to explicitly state that you abhor paedophilia, <laughs> you know something. You're in trouble, man. <laughs> yeah. But it turns out that Epstein tried to sue her for saying this. Yeah, there was a report in the mail that he wanted her to retract her suggestion that he was a paedophile. He got his PR firm to draft a statement about it, that he was apparently very unpleasant and very aggressive, but Fergie stuck to her guns despite the pressure being put on her and refused to comply. Eventually he dropped the case, but I thought 
the positioning of this story was quite interesting because Fergie is quite unpopular in the UK and especially in the press that they tend to think of her as being very greedy and money grubbing and you know taking the sheen off the royals so to be putting the blame on her rather than on Andrew even though as we know the loan came at the request of Prince Andrew that he only did it to help his desperate wife who's a pain of the arse anyway. Yeah they're definitely trying to shift the focus and reframe the story around Andrew the family man but you know this coincides with more details coming out from uh, Virginia Roberts. He denies that it ever happened and he's going to keep denying that it ever happened but he knows the truth and I know the truth. She did an interview on the NBC program Dateline with five other victims of Epstein in which they talked about his crimes and she spoke again about her allegations against Prince Andrew. So we knew these before but It's a lot more compelling seeing her talking about them rather than reading the text. And one line that I thought was really good was when she talked about him being a prince. She said, he was royalty and it just stuck in my mind. I grew up watching Disney movies and princesses and princes were the good people of the world and he wasn't. It's a devastating line, like so moving to see her talking about this in this way she repeated a lot of the details that we know already about him being a hideous dancer going back to jelaine's london townhouse the foot licking incident all of that stuff the more she talks about it the less it can be ignored yeah and especially because she's such an articulate and engaging speaker Mm. could get even worse though story in the times today that MI6 are worried that Russia may have obtained compromising material or compromat on Prince Andrew and the Epstein scandal. I thought it couldn't get any bigger, but now we've got like potential Russian spies involved as well. It sounds like a movie. There's basically this former police officer from Florida who had access to the Epstein investigation when he was working in Palm Beach which is where a lot of the original investigation took place. His name is John Mark Duggan and he may have passed some of this information on to Russian authorities. He fell out with his bosses in 2009 and moved to Moscow and he's been posting on Facebook since the case reopened and saying that he had confidential documents that no one else had seen. I mean, he sounds like he's probably nuts, but, like, (laughs) it's very interesting to see where it's going to go. I'm convinced he's aware of the compromise. On to our quote of the week. Though, something a bit more positive. Definitely the highlight of Fashion Week in London was Billy Porter. He was on a lot of the front rows, generally being a delight, looking sensational. And he spoke to people at the Christopher Kane show, at which he said, I've been doing my Meghan Markle all week with my little fascinator. I might keep wearing it when I get back to America. There's a black woman in the palace, honey. That's all we need. We're loving her over in America. I love this. (laughs) Another really cool addition to Meghan's fan squad. Oh my God. What a great little team she has behind her. And also very keen on doing a Meghan Markle. Yeah, as a thing, we'll both be doing a Meghan Markle as often as we can. And just again, reminding her and everyone else that however much people seem to have it in for her over in the UK, they're loving her over in America. Speaking of Meg and Tom, it's really only one choice for fit for a queen this week, right? I was going to say, I mean, she's proved that she's absolutely worthy of such a fashionable endorsement <laughs> because her outfit at Misha Nunu's wedding was so cool. Absolutely gorgeous dress. Oh my God. We only saw the back of it, basically, from these... And not even the full thing. <laughs> we got, yeah. like, the her top half. But it was a semi-sheer, sequin-embellished tulle Valentino gown, black, with these gold and diamond earrings, hair in that kind of messy bun style. Astonishingly beautiful dress love that Megan is wearing Valentino wish I could have seen the front of the dress Tom I dreamed about <laughs> <laughs> that I saw the front of this dress which just shows you how 
far gone I am at this stage. What was it like? <laughs> well, it was much like the pictures that we had seen. <laughs> but she obviously got the dress fully lined because we cannot see the royal boobs. <laughs> Speaking of royal boobs, our first in line, it's Charles. The first in line. <laughs> I thought Charles did really well this week. This Fan and Omi project is really on a stand to him, in my opinion. It shows that he is quietly working away on lots of things in the background that he's not shouting about. You know, he didn't even post on Instagram about it. It seemed like something he was happy to help with without taking credit for. Yeah. There wasn't a lot of reporting around it either, which is a pity because it was such a cool project. I feel like it's a good antidote to this idea of him as like kind of meddling and stuff, which he has had in the past. I also enjoyed a piece in the Telegraph by their royal reporter Hannah Furness who was talking about this kind of behaviour as being very common from Charles and Camilla that royal reporters often see it on the road that basically every day Charles will hear from a new person he thinks might benefit from a connection with one of his charities. He will insist they are put in touch and will often check in to find out how things are going. Hannah Furness said that there's no doubt that in a world where meeting a member of the royal family can still make someone's day, week, or lifetime, this tactic makes people feel heard, and it works. Oh, a great role model for the rest of the royals. (laughs) Well done, Charles. So well done, you. Next week, what have we got coming up? Harry and Meghan's tour is starting on Monday, so obviously that's going to be very exciting, but I am also tremendously excited to see whether Kate is going to go along with this boat naming. You may remember (laughs) the public vote to choose a name for a ship at which everyone voted for Boaty McBoatface. (laughs) So stupid. But they have gone in the face of public opinion and chosen in the face of both my both face <laughs> and come with rrs sir david Assenborough. but will kate toe the line or will she go rogue and as she slams that bottle of champagne on the hole <laughs> cry out I name the Bodhi mcboat face our eyes sir Bodhi mcboat face <laughs> and they're on in there's nothing they can do because kate's had her way Anyway, thank you so much for listening this week. We would love to hear from you guys. We were thrilled to receive a little package this week from some listeners over in Australia, Sarah, Jane and Emma. Thank you so much for the royal bunting and stationery. We have been enjoying it with some cupcakes this afternoon. We're going to put a picture up on Instagram later, so check that out. We are at Airheads Pod on Instagram and Twitter, and you can find us on Facebook at Airheads. Leave us a rating or review wherever you get your podcasts. We hope you come back and join us next week. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So well done, you.